The Invisible Man, directed by James Whale and released by Universal Pictures in 1933. I'm Andrew Olson. Welcome to a classic cinema review. The Invisible Man is based off of H.G. Wells' classic science fiction novel of the same name. The film opens during a snowstorm in February along the English countryside. A stranger, bundled up from head to toe, trudges his way through the storm and enters a small inn. All of the patrons, the innkeeper and his wife, are all taken aback by the appearance of this stranger, not because of the way he's dressed, but because his face is completely obscured by bandages and dark tinted goggles. The stranger wants a room, food, and no disturbances. Once he is situated in his new room, he undertakes the, uh, the problem of finding his way back by using a chemistry set. Unfortunately, all of the attention he received downstairs makes it uh, rather difficult for him to conduct his work without interruption. The innkeeper's wife keeps bothering him to no avail and ends up driving this stranger into uh, a hostile state. The innkeeper gives him an a, uh, eviction notice and when the stranger refuses to leave, the police are called in. The stranger, with the police on site, decides that there's only one thing left to do. He has to reveal who he really is and what he really looks like. This is probably one of my favorite scenes in the movie, as there is a, a long but um, satisfying build-up to this reveal. He unwraps his face, taking all the bandages and goggles off, only to reveal he is an invisible man. He begins wreaking havoc on the unsuspecting citizens of the town that he is staying in and eventually escapes the police with uh, not much they can do to stop someone they can't see or find. Elsewhere, Dr. Cranley discusses with his daughter Flora the month-long absence of chemist Dr. Jack Griffin. A Dr. Kemp who is another scientist employed by Dr. Cranley says that Ke that um, Griffin was working on something rather secret, something that he probably should not have been messing with. Kemp and Cranley search for Griffin's notes and all they find is a list of chemicals, one of which has the rather unsettling side effect of causing madness if uh, ingested. It turns out that the stranger in the inn who is invisible is indeed Dr. Jack Griffin and he is suffering from a uh, rather small case of megalomania with uh, slight aspirations of taking over the world. It's up to Dr. Cranley, Flora and Dr. Kemp to try and dissuade Griffin in their own unique ways to stop his uh, terrorizing of the, uh, the countryside and to prevent any further damage to be from being done. And of course, they also have to stop him before the police and the growing mob of angry citizens get to him first. I haven't read H.G. Wells' novel, but I am somewhat familiar with his works, and I know that he is known for his... Um, his provocative social satires on the uh, problems in society. The film doesn't focus so much on this. This is more of a straight-ahead science fiction story with the mad scientist as the main character, but that doesn't mean it's a bad movie. It's actually uh, a very good movie and a classic in its own right. When you think of The Invisible Man, usually to portray such a character in uh, a way that is convincing, you need really good special effects. And this film is uh, a perfect example of great special effects from that era. John P. Fulton is credited with doing most of these special effects in the film, and they are surprisingly good. They hold up very well, even to this day. The scene where uh, the Invisible Man reveals himself to be invisible for the first time is probably one of my favorite scenes in the entire movie. Just the, uh, it, there's a long build up to that reveal and uh, 
I had to sit back and think about what the audiences in 1933 would have been thinking when they first saw that scene because it was something that they really would never have seen before up until that point in time. Nowadays, to achieve invisibility, as it were, uh, digital effects, blue screen and green screen, and that kind of uh, technology would easily be implemented and would make that possible. But in those days, there was sort of an early version of blue screen and green screen. It was basically using black velvet, I think it was. The, um, the black velvet did not absorb light. And therefore, if you had something that was lighter than that, that lighter piece could be photographed and you could take and um, use multiple prints. First you'd film the actor, then you'd film the background, uh, maybe the objects in the foreground and so on and so forth. And whatever was covered in the black velvet would disappear when the prints were overlaid over each other. Uh, very early blue screen and green screen. It's very interesting. But just because there are a lot of special effects in the movie does not mean that the movie is centered around those effects. There is still a very human element in the movie. The, um, the character of the Invisible Man or Dr. Jack Griffin is played by Claude Rains. And Rains has a a very particular presence, although we only see him for a few seconds throughout the entire movie, that is, we only see his face and what he looks like, his voice and his distinctive laugh really bring the character to life. Uh, and of course he portrays the Invisible Man, he's all wrapped up in bandages, so it's him, but you don't actually see him, as it were. His fiance Flora is played by Gloria Stewart. Uh, who had been in several other films of uh, Universal Pictures at the time. She does a, a wonderful job. She's very beautiful to look at, but she also does a good job of playing the more sympathetic character. She is sought after by Dr. Kemp, who is played by William Harrigan. Uh, Dr. Kemp is sort of a spineless do or at least that's, that's the way I, I like to picture him. But um, he also plays Dr. Kemp rather well, I think. At least it, it fits the film and the story. Henry Travers plays Dr. Cranley, uh, Flora's father. He is not featured so much in the film as the other two, but uh, his performance is uh, decent enough. There's a lot of unexpected, rather sardonic humor, uh, kind of dark humor in the film, and a lot of this is brought on by the um, the fact that the innocent, unknowing citizens of this small community are all of a sudden thrust into this unreasonable situation of an invisible man wreaking havoc in their lives, and um, Una O'Connor, who plays the innkeeper's wife, does an excellent job of playing the um, sort of half half crazed half um, misunderstood individual who just she just can't take the, uh, the possibility that somebody staying in her inn is invisible and um, that humor while it is so, it has a tendency to be on the dark side or the twisted side the humor in the movie takes that rather dark horror genre tone and it makes the it gives the audience a chance to relax for a, a few moments to take a breath and then get back to the uh, the more science fiction and horror aspects of the movie you get a relief from all of this humor and uh, it is very funny to see the um, the uh, the other minor characters reacting to a situation of an invisible man which is it impossible in real life probably but if it were possible, how would you react? The film was scored by Heinz Romheld. There's not a whole lot of film score music in this movie, but what little there is does fit. And Universal Pictures, for their film scores, had a particular sound in the 30s and 40s. 
it is a universal score. There is no question about it. Universal Pictures, by the way, was a still rather small studio at the time. They aren't. They weren't the big studio that they are today. Uh, but it was films such as The Invisible Man and the other uh, classic horror monster pictures, such as Frankenstein and um, Dracula and The Mummy, that kept the studio going. Also, the quality of the filmmaking is is what gave Universal its reputation. Nothing about this movie seems cheap. It may not be the most extravagant of a production, and um, indeed, this is not an intricate plot by any means. There are some liberties taken from the, uh, the novel, from what I understand, but the story it's in, in and of itself is an effective one, as well as the, the acting and the, um, the production value as well. So this is a, a decent quality film, and I'm going to recommend it. I'm going to give it a... Um, I'm going to give it a 4 out of 5 star rating. It's uh, looking back at it, and uh, certainly for the special effects of the movie, but for many aspects of the film. It's the phone. Don't go away. I'm back. The nerve of some people, you know? At any rate, the, um, the production values and the, the overall story of the film, while not extravagant, they hold up, and looking back, it's easy to see why this movie is a classic today. So four out of five stars, two thumbs up, I recommend it. I'm Andrew Olson, thank you for watching another Classic Cinema Review. If you would like to see more Classic Cinema Reviews, please hit that like button, subscribe, leave a comment down below and let me know if you've enjoyed the movie in the past, or if you will be seeing it based on my review. And of course, if you enjoyed the movie posters and photographs seen in this video, please head over to drmacro.com where you can find these and many more high-resolution scans of your favorite actors, actresses, and memorabilia from your favorite movies from eras gone by. Thank you, Jerry, so much for providing great memorabilia for this video, as always. And of course, I thank all of you for watching, and I look forward to seeing all of you next time.